Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're talking to Dr. Shantanu Nundi, Chief Medical Officer at Accolade and Senior Advisor to the World Bank. Dr. Nundi is also a primary care physician internist in a safety net clinic in Washington, D.C., and the author of a forthcoming book called Care After COVID. He'll be discussing a new framework that he's developed for healthcare post-pandemic and sent the central role of the physician in leading the change ahead. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer here in Chicago. Uh, welcome, Dr. Nandi. I'm excited to learn more about your book and your framework. Um, why don't you start by telling us, you know, how you initially got thinking about this new framework for healthcare post-COVID? Yeah, well, Todd, so great to, to, to be here and have a chance to chat with you. Um, I didn't plan on writing a book or developing a framework. You know, uh, a month into the pandemic, when, if you remember, everyone was talking about testing, 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 where can we get tested? I had a really simple idea, you know, as a lot of doctors do who are on the front lines. I said, what if t patients could test themselves and do it at home? And so that's really what started me on this journey. I asked the question, I wrote an op-ed, uh, it went viral. People were really interested in the idea, but policymakers didn't get it. And that's when I realized we needed a way to sort of shift their mindset. And that's the whole genesis of the framework. You've been, you know, you work in a kind of a safety net clinic. How did that kind of inform your perspective and understanding, you know, and this create this vision for uh, the future? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, uh, I get most of my ideas from clinic. You know, I think the, the framework's really simple. It's we, we believe that healthcare needs to become distributed digitally enabled and decentralized. And so when I think about my clinic, when I think about dis distributed, it's we need to meet patients where they are. You know, coming to my clinic isn't the easiest thing in the world for my safety net patients, right? They got to take a half day off of work and find an appointment, find someone to, to take care of their kids and wait in a waiting room. And so distributed is just, hey, can we use virtual? Can we use home-based care to, to meet them where they are? Um, digitally enabled. So what I noticed is a lot of my patients, they have a hard time making it to appointments, taking their medications, learning about their conditions, but they're always texting each other, right? And so can we use new simple technologies like messaging to connect with our patients between visits so it's more continuous and easier to get to? Um, and then decentralized um, is this idea of just giving doctors at the front lines and nurses more resources. I, I remember this patient I had who um, was in and out of the hospital uh, with heart failure and patients with heart failure, they need to check their weight every day. And I just asked her, I said, do you have a weighing machine? And she was very shy to say, no, I don't. And so I just handed her uh, 20 bucks out of my, my wallet and realized that you know we can pay for a $10,000 hospital visit for her, but we can't give someone 10 or 20 bucks to get a weighing machine. And so that's what I mean by decentralized. Yeah, that's so important. In fact, I have my, my 86 year old mother visiting this week and talking about her blood pressure and I you know, brought out my home uh, uh, blood pressure monitoring device and uh, uh, measured it right there. You know, these, these challenges that you bring up in your kind of three Ds, which you're you know, saying basically it's distributed, digitally enabled and decentralized. Yeah. Like that's a great vision for where we need to go. And obviously there are gonna be a lot of challenges in this. I mean, for one thing, you know, we just went from zero to 100 miles an hour in terms of like telehealth. And there are a lot of issues in that and not just the infrastructure and technology part of it. Can you talk about just let's, let's focus on that part, the digitally enabled part. What are going to be the obstacles there to seeing that brought to life? Yeah, it's a great question. And there's going to be no shortage of obstacles, right? I mean, I think the first is we know that not everyone is wired up, right? So whether that's you live in a place that don't have bandwidth, you don't have a connected device, or you don't, you know, have the digital literacy um, to be able to use those tools. I think that's that's a huge challenge for us to make healthcare much more equitable uh, and inclusive. I think the second challenge is really workflow. I think every doctor understands our workflows and and really figure out how to integrate that into our workflow so that we can seamlessly go between yeah a patient that needs to be seen in an office because that's not going to go away to a patient who needs to be seen virtually and how do we sort of shift between those two very different worlds. But I think the biggest one that we're not talking about is the fact that we don't want to just take a healthcare experience that may not get the outcomes we want that's in person and move to a healthcare experience that may not get us the outcomes we want in a virtual world, right? And that was the mistake mistake we made with medical records. Every doctor knows that experience of, okay, you took a paper chart and you basically scanned it on a $100 million piece of software. 
right? But you didn't make the documentation process better. What we need to do is take digital and actually change the way that we care for patients, right? Rather than like for someone like diabetes, it's not let's see them today and then in three months and in three months and hope that they're going to eat the right things and do the right things. It's how do we actually start uh, meeting them where they are sort of on a more daily or weekly basis so that we're giving them those little nudges and that little education they need to actually change their daily behaviors. So that's real, you know, digital transformation of the patient experience and care that's as right. opposed to, you know, what you said, like with an EHR, just trans transferring one not very ideal situation into something that you can do on the computer. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, how do you how do you push forward with something like this? I'm, I'm encouraged, you know, for instance, that, you know, broadband is part of like this infrastructure initiative that we're seeing kind of uh, percolating yeah. right now. Yeah. You know, what are the other things that are going to have to happen for this to move ahead? Yeah, I, I think a huge part of this is about leadership um, and really, I think, physician leadership. The example I give is during the pandemic, my mom, who has type 2 diabetes and has had it for 25 years, been on insulin for 15 years she completely got off of insulin in a month and she did that because you know she kept hearing about you know with if you have diabetes covid's worse covid's worse right and she was just and she's she signed up for this digital service uh that does this program called diabetes reversal and what it does is you know it it helps patients get on a ketogenic diet it gives you an a, a doctor who will help you titrate down your medications um, you get a nutritionist, you get a coach, uh, you get you get a peer. So for my mom, who's from from India and eats a lot of Indian food, they connected her with another uh, reversal patient in Chicago, who is also from India and also vegetarian to help her with her diet. Right. So this is an example of the type of transformation, Todd, that I talk about, which is we didn't just say, OK, my mom has a in-person diabetes doctor. Now let's get her a virtual diabetes doctor. We reimagine the entire experience to say, what are all the things that a patient who wants to go on this journey and potentially find a be better way to manage their care, what are all the things that person needs and how can technology make that simpler? Like connecting with that gentleman in Chicago was a lot easier with technology, right? Um, uh, that's what we need. And I think we need a lot more of those proof points and then we need physicians to really advocate for that level of transformation. You know, that's interesting because, you know, a big part uh, initiative at the AMA is around uh, hypertension. Yeah. And, you know, self-monitoring blood pressure is a big, big initiative. And it has to, you know, encompass all those things that you talked about right there, uh, which, you know, not, not the least is having, you know, the right equipment at home to be able to do that. And then the infrastructure to be able to communicate on an ongoing basis with your physician health system. Uh, so that 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 progress can be monitored. Well, let, let's talk a little bit more about the role that physicians, you know, play in implementing this type of change. You know, what what can a physician do? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, and it's it's definitely very bespoke. I mean, that's kind of my whole idea of decentralized. Is I think you know your population, you know what your clinic capabilities are, you know your specialty. And using all that, how do you bring, how do you sort of cr bring these kind of creative solutions to bear on the front lines, right? A, and I think a great example is the types of stuff we did during the pandemic. I mean, look, we, you know, we, you know, the fact that we offer drive-through testing as an example, right? There is no regulation needed for that. For years, clinics like mine has have, have had to figure out how to test people for the flu every fall. And every fall, we have sick people waiting inside the waiting room where they're coughing and sneezing at each other, right, just to see us for a few minutes so we can do a rapid uh, test. And now we move that to the parking lot. And there is no regulation needed for that. Um, we have the power to do that. And I hope what I'm seeing across the country as I talk to doctors is, in many respects, doctors built a muscle over the past year that we didn't really have. We've actually created an entire generation of doctors who kind of think public health and now have operational experience doing that. And so what I'm sort of saying is let's take that muscle and let's start applying it to diabetes. Let's start applying it to mental health. Let's start applying it to, you know, for folks that are specialists out there, the things that they're working on. Um, so much more is possible. And I think we've gotten as a as a profession, we've we've actually uh, gotten a lot 
uh, more tools, uh, toolkits and tools under our belts now. I love that. I mean, I love your, you know, referring to that as kind of a new muscle, a new capability that has occurred, uh, you know, over the course of the pandemic. I know, you know, just thinking about my team and the same things that we've gone through, like after this pandemic, people talk about going back to normal. Well, I don't want to go back to the way it was before because there are a lot of, you know, things that we've done that work better, that are more fair. The access is better. And I think that's what you're, you're, you're really getting at is let's, let's use this new muscle and we don't need to return the way things were exactly before. Well, let's, let's talk about your book. Um, that's exciting. It's coming out uh, in early May, on May 4th. You know, what do you, what do you hope that physicians and other readers, you know, take away uh, from what you've written? Yeah, no, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that question because for me, you know, I don't need another job. I mean, I, I did this. So many physicians, I think, have stepped up in the past year. You know, you see physicians on TV, physicians helping to lead in their communities, right? And for me, I really thought hard about what I wanted to do. And for me, I think more than anything else is it's, it's creating that mindset shift, right? Um, I think there's a lot of people talking about virtual, a lot of people talking about home base, but I purposely said, well, I think the right word is distributed, right? And why? Because it's not like all care is virtual, right? I mean, even for patients who had COVID, someone still had to stick a Q-tip in someone's nose, right? That's a very physical thing. Someone still had to fill a medicine. Someone still had to swallow that medicine. And so saying virtual, I think, is 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 not doing us, I think, the thinking about the full episode of care and saying, well, distribute it. Similarly, you know, a lot of physicians have been hearing, you know, AI, 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 and, you know, AI is going to replace your job or, and, and the EHR is the technology that we most know and don't love. Digitally enabled, I purposely said to say, well, what are you digitally enabling? Well, you're digitally enabling the doctor-patient relationship. And then finally, the word decentralized, right? It's a lot of us are hearing value-based care, population health, but you can't just hand doctors, a, you know, the financial risk of their patients and say, okay, well, good luck with that, right? What you need to do, I, I believe, is decentralize. Give them more resources, more authority, simple things. My nurses can't go to someone's house today and draw their blood at home. Like there's just so much regulation for things that don't need to be there. And so my hope is that by creating these this new vocabulary, right, that what we're gonna do is help people shift their mindset um, and then make decisions on their own. I don't have all the answers, but that mindset shift will allow physicians and other leaders at the front lines to be able to make those right decisions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what like you talked about how things get hard, right? So for example, you know, you say, well, oh, well, digital, not everyone has access, et cetera. I, I worry without the right framework, people say, well, that means we should just pull back versus saying, well, how do we actually make digital work, right? And I think that's what I'm trying to help people make those kinds of in investment and sort of decisions. That makes so much sense. I mean, in my own kind of journey in terms of digital transformation, so much of what is key is setting out the vision for where it is that you want to get to, yeah. and then just laying out the steps so that people aren't stopped in their tracks. I think, you know, when you talk about digital transformation, it's sometimes kind of intimidating, but I think the way that your book lays it out in terms of those three Ds, you know, we can see those are, those are not out of reach uh, yes. for us to get where we want to be. Um, well, let me, let me ask you one kind of one more question. We touched a little bit on it in terms of, you know, uh, the digitally enabled part and access, you know, that, that is, you know, we've seen a real challenge to equity. And you are uh, one of 11 external advisors working with AMA on its equity and innovation strategy through our Center for Health Equity. Can you talk about that work and why it's so important right now? Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. And it's, it's an amazing initiative of the AMA. I think the AMA is really stepping forward and talking about issues like structural racism and and, and all the challenges that we have and the inequities that we've seen. And I think it's, I think it is critical. I mean, this idea that innovation's always been in medicine. I think sometimes people forget that, right? Doctors are really innovative. You know, we're always trying to read the latest articles and study the latest things. But I think what we're doing now is saying, yeah, but innovation and equity, they're not two different things. They're actually the same thing. Because what we wanna do all doctors want is we want to improve outcomes and what patients want are better outcomes. But when we talk about outcomes, who whose outcomes are we talking about, right? And I think that's what 
I think saying outcomes and equity, innovation and equity are going to become synonymous. But then how do you do that work? And that's what this center, I think, is trying to do is say, this isn't a one and done. This isn't a you know single you know article or a single moment. When you talk about something being structural, it is structural. <laughs> it means you got to understand the macro, the the meso, the micro involved with it. You got to find those those places. Whether it's let's get m more diversity in in who's making these decisions. Let's get more diversity in terms of board representation. All the way down to let's have solutions that we know disproportionately are better um, for for patients. So, for example, I mentioned text messaging earlier. Actually, uh, more low income patients uh, use text messaging than than middle or high income patients, and that's because for them it's a necessity. For us, it's a luxury. And so, building solutions using something like text messaging is actually one of those rare things that doesn't just lift all boats. It actually lifts. Um, those that are uh, most vulnerable more than it does um, those who are less vulnerable. And so that's really what this is about. I, I'm, I'm interested just to hear maybe a couple other examples because something you said is you have to you, you're really focused on outcomes and for whom. Because yeah. I think if the for whom part is not kind of built into that equation, there are things that can get skipped. Uh, in innovation and entire populations that can be overlooked. Is there anything you know that you've seen in your journey thus far where taking that different lens in terms of equity affects the direction of innovation? Yeah, um, I think my probably best example is the work that I've seen um, at the World Bank, um, where we've you know scaled community health worker. Um, programs, um, you know, this idea that you could train sort of lay people um, who are from the community to kind of do basic education, triage. I mean, I think that's the kind of solution that um, we know uh, works best in the most vulnerable uh, communities. Uh, and one that, you know, when we talk about one where we didn't talk about today yet, Todd, is the word trust, right? What, you know, we talk about innovation, but one of my mentors said, Chanda, I know you want to innovate, but medicine moves at the speed of trust. And so you want to make create change fast, but what about trust? And so community health workers are a great example of they already have the trust of the patients we're trying to we're trying to reach. So how do we then leverage that existing trust to be able to then you know get to the health outcomes we're trying to get to? Indeed, uh, innovation does move at the speed of trust, and I think we're seeing that you know in the in this pandemic uh, more than ever. Yes. Uh, I'm so excited by you know what uh, this book is going to say. I can't wait to read it and talk to you more about it. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nandi, for being on the COVID-19 update today. Yeah. Uh, that's it for today's segment. We'll be back with another segment shortly. In the meantime, for resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.